Okay, so in the robotics and programming labs, we have uh, this slideshow will be shared with you all. I'm going to post it on the website so you'll be able to actually watch the, the videos that are in here. I'm not going to click play on them because I don't want to um, have it be too much at once. But essentially, uh, these videos have just a little bit of a demo of what is included in each of the labs in case um, you haven't seen it or in case you want to dig in more. Um, so in the robotics and programming, we have the Spiro Bolts, which are the round little robots, as well as the Spiro Indies, which are the little car looking um, robots. And these are accompanied by the um, mats and the craft packs that go along with them to provide uh, the most robust user experience for them. Um, and these are really applicable um, PK-12, uh, depending on how you want to use them. Uh, Spiro has lots of resources on you know, how to use it in the different contexts. Um, and we are planning for our CSI, uh, computer science integration, uh, professional learning cohort to have more support for those as well. And that's the same for all of our lab options. That's what I was trying to prevent from happening. All right, in the augmented and virtual reality, um, we have the Merge EDU school-wide license. So that's a uh, software platform to use the Merge Cubes with, and there's all sorts of like ready to go uh, resources there that educators who maybe aren't even familiar with augmented or virtual reality, but wanna experiment with their students, um, they can find stuff in there that's kind of already ready to go and they don't have to design anything and their students don't have to design anything. Um, then there's also co-spaces that comes with this where you can design um, experiences on the merge cube. So you see kind of in this video down below here uh, that you can actually design uh, experiences like 3D, it's 3D design essentially that your students would be engaging in um, with the merge cubes. And then three sets of 30 merge cubes. So you could do, you could have a session where you did all 90 or you could split them up into, you know, three or four different classrooms where you have um, the, the groups of them. Then we have the coding and hardware, which has the um, Lego uh, kits. So we have the Lego Spike Essentials, which is the elementary option, and then the Lego Spike Prime, uh, which is the secondary option. We have had some folks who wanted the secondary for their elementary and some who wanted the elementary for their secondary, which is totally fine. I think it's really about looking at what comes in each one and deciding what is the best fit for your school and where, where your school or your students are at with um, computer science, with coding and hardware, um, and all, all of those kinds of things. Next, I'm gonna to pass to Shelly and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about ordering and invoicing and reimbursement. And as Brandy mentioned, we do notice that there are some questions in the chat box. Brandy is doing a wonderful job of collecting those questions and making sure that we allow some time at the end to engage in conversation with you folks and respond to those questions. So continue to keep those questions coming in the chat box. That will help us to identify uh, some resources that we might need to be made available to you folks or uh, our responses on in the interim. So we're going to jump into ordering. And as I mentioned on the onset of the webinar, this project is a subgrant funded with federal emergency relief funds. So it is a GEAR initiative. So the governor has conveyed that this is a, a value in our school districts and has really established some energy and some focus of how to incorporate computer science into every classroom that any kiddo in our state is in. So we wanna just be sure that we highlight a few things that come about when utilizing federal emergency relief funds to make any purchases. And some of this information, if you folks happen to be at the table or engaged with an ESER grant, um, ARP, Carissa Cares, this information will be not new to you, but I just do want to be sure that we're highlighting that this is a federal emergency relief programs, which accompanies rules and regulations set forth by statute and state regulations. So we want to be sure that you're following your local procurement policies and you folks all have an SAU that engages in this work, whether it be um, in companion with an organization who supports 
some of those identification process, but we want to be sure that you go back and revisit your local procurement policies and follow those to a T. Mm -hmm. A couple of the things that we have here is make, making sure you're effective with your internal control. So anything that is purchased with federal funds, whether it be emergency funds or other federal funds, have a certain set of federal statutes and requirements that, they're, that they need to abide by. One of them, which is one of the biggest ones that we want to call your attention to is inventory. So if you are receiving an item, you need to be sure that you're, you're identifying that item and also inventorying. Your SAU should have an internal process that has been identified for inventorying. There's certain requirements of that inventorying process that we'll be sure to communicate clearly to you folks, but it is very similar as if you would have bought an iPad with emergency relief funding under Carissa or CARES or ARP. So kind of keep that in mind while you're acquiring these items based on this federal funding source. Also, again, because it is a federal emergency relief funded project, there will be some reporting and some audit items that are required. So if, for example, we come to the district and we say, we would love to see your inventory lists that encompass all of your federal emergency relief funds. If you purchased Legos, or um, you know the, the robot kits, we will want to see those on your inventory list. So just keeping in mind the requirements that you have for maybe even an ARP project are going to be identical to this project. When you're placing your orders, you're going to do that directly through the vendors. So we know that you've either submitted a Microsoft form or a GEMS application. We will need to have GEMS applications submitted and approved for all districts who are participating in this program. Um, the Microsoft form was just to alleviate some of the pressure with our GEMS software um, on the onset of this work and the due date of being 9-30-2022. So you will utilize the information in the GEMS application as well as this order form to be able to work with those vendors and order directly with the vendors. We as a department are not ordering those goods on your behalf. You will do that. So I highlighted the inventory um, and it gets its own section here because it is important. It's not anything that if you've purchased other goods with federal emergency relief, nothing is going to be different. But that third bullet really identifies what your inventory list must have by statute. So we're looking at descriptions, makes and models, the vendor of which it was purchased, the acquisition date, the cost, the physical location, and the general usability of that item. So determining if it's still in good working operating order, or if something's had to be replaced, or if it's been lost or stolen. All of that information will be kept on your inventory list. And then every item will need to be tagged. And this inventory process of this property should be conducted annually. And of course, as I mentioned, these are federal emergency relief funds. So if you happen to be a district who is being monitored under the emergency relief funds, this might be one of the items that we ask you to generate is an inventory list. And that might include the computers that you bought with CARES, but it would also include your kits that you bought with um, GEAR funding in this program. So the next section is about invoicing and reimbursement. So again, we're utilizing the GEMS platform. So the 4PCA uh, website has the application, but it also has a federal grant reimbursement system. And that federal reimbursement system is information that you will want to work with your business managers with. Your business managers will need to submit a trial, a detailed trial balance that has a billing period that matches this sub grants performance period, as well as any copies of paid receipts and purchase orders. So when you're ordering and you're acquiring those items, after you've acquired the items, you've confirmed that they've been received and they've been received in, in a manner that is equivalent to your standards at the SAU, so not damaged or broken or um, in pieces, you can then submit for a reimbursement request of those expenses that you've incurred 
the federal grant reimbursement system on GEMS will only open up to the district once a application in GEMS has been approved. So essentially there's some coding in the back that says, you know, RSU, I'll use my home district, RSU 16 has submitted an application for the computer science mobile labs. It has been approved. And then the GEMS federal grant reimbursement system opens up for RSU 16 to be able to submit a reimbursement request um, and detailed trial balance. A note at the bottom, just to draw your attention to, sales tax is not an allowable expense of federal funds. So if you happen to incur a sales tax on any of these items, that dollar value is going to need to be deducted from your request of your reimbursement. So we are asking that you are submitting all requests, also known as invoices, within the federal grant reimbursement system no later than December 30th. This is a date by statutory language that we must close out these grants. So if there is any invoice that is submitted after December 30th, you will not be eligible to uh, receive reimbursement. So that December 30th, if not earlier date, is something you wanna keep in mind. And also please, Keep in mind that the reimbursement process takes anywhere from 17 to 45 days. So our team takes anywhere from five to 10 days to review the materials, the detailed trial balance, as well as the invoices and receipts. And then it goes through a secondary level of review and that is through our Department of Administrative and Financial Services. So by statutory language, they have up to 30 days to be able to review any invoices that are submitted, and then it takes anywhere from three to 10 days to issue your check or to issue a direct deposit. So that timeline can be very different depending on um, where we are as a team, depending on how DAFs is their workload within DAFs, but also how you've selected to receive any federal emergency relief funds, whether that be an electronic deposit or a check. All right, thank you, Shelley. Um, so at this point, I think uh, let's start with the questions that have come in in the chat um, and see if that answers anybody's questions that they might have. And then after that, I'll open um, if you wanna come off mute and ask your question if it wasn't answered, um, that would be awesome. But I'm gonna, um, I think I'll just scroll to the top of the chat. In the one note, okay. I'm gonna stop sharing because I don't think you need to sit on the Q and A. Where'd you say you put it? In the one note where I have it. Okay. And they page under it for what? Perfect. Thank you. I have just so y'all know, I have Brandy Coda in the room with me, and she's helping to keep us all on track and take care of questions and whatnot. So you can't see her, but she is here helping us to stay on track. So thank you to Brandy. Okay, so if after we add up our expected costs and we have funding left over in the grant, can we purchase extra craft packs for Spiro? No, um, what is outlined in the lab is what is included and what is eligible for reimbursement. Uh, next question, is it correct that we need to purchase carts uh, from Amazon separately for all CS carts? Yes, the uh, see, the cart itself is an individual purchase that is not folded into any of the um, like vendor orders. So when you reach out to Sphero and you order your Sphero products or Merge or Lego, um, you're just getting the products that they provide and the carts themselves need to be purchased uh, individually. Um, can you share more information about the licensing approach to co-spaces? Does everyone in the school get access? Looking forward to using it. Can you also share prices for futures if you have it? Um, so the licensing approach to co-spaces um, is different than the merge EDU. So the merge EDU is school-wide, so anyone in the school gets uh, access to that license. Co-spaces, there are 90 licenses that are included, um, and the idea with that is there are 90 merge cubes, so the idea of pairing 
Um, how districts uh, administer those licenses are is a local decision. Um, you could, you know, have an account that goes and gets reassigned based on who's using it, or if you have those being used, um, you know, maybe CoSpaces is only being used in, you know, a grade level or a classroom and you want to allocate those licenses that way. Um, we would be happy to provide some suggestions on best practice, but that is ultimately a, a local decision as to how you want to administer those licenses. But there are 90 CoSpaces licenses to match the 90 merge cubes. Um, prices for future years are up to local. It's a local decision to negotiate with the vendors. Um, I, there's been some talk that Actum might help to um, negotiate a better price, uh, but after this first year of the mobile lab grant program, that becomes a uh, local responsibility. Do we have to order the kits that the superintendent put into the state portal last month? Um, can we make a different kit choice? So yes, the kits have to be ordered. Um, the form itself was uh, essentially claiming your funding for them, but the orders then have to be placed. Um, and uh, depending on the question, can we make a different kit choice? I think that is uh, dependent on a few different things, Shelley. So if you are choosing to make a different cart choice than, that, than was identified in the GEMS application, you will need to reach out to me and ask for your application to be reopened because anyone who might not be familiar with federal emergency relief funds, we essentially align the invoice request directly to the application and that's what we're allowing reimbursement for. It's the pre-approval that is required of federal emergency relief funds that allows you to receive that reimbursement. So if that invoice does not allow to uh, align directly to that application, we will return it to you folks. And so if you are aware that you're making a different choice right now for a kit, I would suggest that you engage in the conversation and have that application reopened now instead of ordering something and then submitting an, an invoice and getting that returned because it doesn't align to the approved application. Awesome. I think the next question is for you, Shelly, as well. How many years does the inventory need to be kept for? So that's a great question. So it needs to be kept through the life of the item, as well as when that item no longer becomes a tangible use item, you have to actually keep it on your inventory list to show that it is no longer operational. So you will see that it's been purchased, that it's been used, every year you'll see how that item is either still in use or not in use. And then once it no longer becomes in use, it still is maintained on your inventory list just as a non-functional item. Okay, the grant award states December 1st. Can you please confirm that it is in fact December 30th? Yes, so December 1st um, was essentially the date that we put in as a safeguard to ensure that folks will um, receive their equipment and reimburse within time. The actual like deadline, we will not receive reimbursement after the date is December 30th. So um, the earlier you submit, the better, but we also recognize that folks have to place orders, orders have to be shipped, you have to receive the inventory um, before you can submit for reimbursement. So we have expanded that deadline to allow folks the most flexibility, but please know that that deadline cannot and will not be extended past December 30th. That is absolute hard and fast deadline. Um, so knowing that this is a super tight turnaround, we have extended it as far as what we possibly can, essentially. So as soon as you can submit for reimbursement, please do so. Um, but December 1st was the safeguard we put into place, and now we've expanded it to really that, that must be in by deadline to provide it the most flexibility for districts. Um, when ordering, do we use the order quote PDFs that were sent to our superintendent and just send to the vendors? So yes, you. Um, I encourage you to use the order uh, quotes uh, that were sent. Um, you can absolutely send those to the vendors. I imagine you'll be sending it with your PO um, and other whatever else you might need. Um, the vendors are aware and prepared for orders. Um, and so they are kind of they'll they know what to do essentially once you reach out and if you're not if you don't have all of the materials that they need they would let you know right away 
Um, for grant setup purposes, should all expenses be charged to instructional supplies except for the license purchase? Shelly. So I'll take that one. So uh, great question, Jenny. Uh, we can see that you operate in federal emergency relief funds for quite some time, and there's a lot of confusion around subscriptions and licenses. For this particular subgrant, and I'm going to say that one more time, for this particular subgrant, the computer science mobile labs, the instructional subscriptions can be included in your supply budget. And the only reason that is, is because these other supplies are not functional without this license. So it's a companionship. So we will not see IXL subscriptions in other supply categories and other federal emergency relief programs. As I said, this is very specific for the computer science labs that the subscriptions are required to be able to use the supplies. So they go together into the supplies category. Shelly, could I follow up with a question? Um, so any contracted service coding needed for paying these, um, these vendors or would we charge the invoice that were you know, creating for the vendor to instructional supplies as well. You charge it to instructional supplies as well, even if it's through a vendor. So what we tried to do was we tried to streamline this subgrant as much as possible. So you will see that a cart might be a total of four thousand seven hundred dollars. Your supply budget, your supply budget is five thousand dollars or five thousand times X number of kits. That is because we wanted to make this process as streamlined as possible for the districts. Awesome. Um, is anyone aware if the vendors accept a tax exempt card? I know that they accept tax exemptions. I don't know about a tax exempt card. Um, they've been pretty amicable and work with education a lot. So I, I don't anticipate that there would be any problems there, but I can't say that I, I know that for sure. Um, if anyone has any experience with that and wants to feel free to chime in on the chat. Um, can the, share, the slide deck be shared with us? Yes, the slide deck is going to be posted to our website. Um, we'll drop the link to the website itself into the chat, uh, but we will do that before um, the end of the day today. Uh, Shelly, what fund and revenue codes should we use for this? So I'm going to say it out loud and then I'll put it in the chat box. So the fund code is 2622. Fund code is 2622. And the revenue code is 4544. Revenue code is 4544. And you'll put that in the chat. Thank you. Our finance department is asking for a signed contract between MDOE and our superintendent for the CSML gear grant. Could you share if this will occur? Um, I don't believe there's any need for a contract between us and the district themselves. Um, if there are any concerns, we'd be happy to, oh, Shelly. So um, I think maybe the question is related to a grant award notification. And the grant award notification is generated as soon as your, <clears throat> excuse me, your computer science mobile lab is approved, the application is approved. So if you go back into GEMS, you should have an opportunity to download that grant award notification. It is also sent to the applicant coordinator and to the superintendent via email with a link to GEMS to obtain that grant award notification. And that's our, our a contract between the department and the school unit. Awesome, thank you. And if you're, uh, I'm not sure who put that in the chat, but if you're referring to something other than the grant award notice, definitely feel free to reach out directly and we can um, have another conversation. Uh, what if GEMS is not done yet? If the GEM, if you've completed the Microsoft form um, and you've not done the GEMS application, that should be done as soon as possible, preferably before orders are placed so that you can ensure that everything goes through and that there's no um, lurking factors that maybe you weren't aware of. So um, if you filled out the Microsoft form, please do the GEMS application as soon as possible. Um, if you need help getting in or you need help finding out who in your district is the 
um, coordinator for that, definitely reach out to Shelly or myself and we'll help to connect you with that information. Um, the Sphero quote shows shipping for $200. If we change that from one cart to two carts, does that double shipping as well? Uh, the vendors are working to provide the best possible deal for districts. So there are certainly um, volume discounts that can happen both um, in quantity and shipping. So um, I would say submit the quote and you could even ask the question when you reach out to them, um, but they are prepared to provide the best possible deal. So I don't think that that would double your shipping. Um, I think that you might have an increase in shipping, but it also may not if they're already doing the order. So um, they're prepared to talk with you about all of that. So if you're, if you're, it's, if it's Spiro that you're working with, I'd submit the quote and ask the question about shipping. Um, if it's one of the other ones, then I would do the same. Okay, yeah, so I don't know if you folks heard that, but um, I, apparently some, uh, sounds like Courtney, Courtney from Portland, uh, asked uh, Sphero about shipping and they said that it's a flat fee. So it sounds like quantity would not double the shipping cost. Um, some of the items are back ordered. I'm worried about our ability to pay for these items by the end of the year. What happens if we don't get these items prior to 12, 31, 22? Uh, my question back to that is which items you're referring to, um, because I have the vendors have committed to not having any of these items on back order. So if that's an issue you're experiencing, um, if you could reach out to me directly, that would be great. And I will help to advocate or help to resolve whatever issues are going on with that. Um, Shelly, they're asking a question. Uh, we could email the codes to everyone who's registered for this webinar. That's no problem, um, if that would be helpful. The um, funding codes, yeah, we can definitely do that. We, we can email the fund and revenue codes. They're also on your grant award notification. Okay, can DOE provide W-9 forms for the selected vendors for those of us who haven't purchased from them before? So the vendors are handling um, that side of things, like the Spiro quote has the W-9 form um, included in the information for ordering. Uh, but once you, um, yeah, Jennifer, can you reach out to me directly about that, please? The headsets are, um, th those should not be out there anymore. It's uh, there's a mistake on that. So um, let's connect directly on that and we will um, resolve that issue. Sorry, I'm getting blasted in the face with fun all of a sudden. Um, okay. Yeah, so I would say contact the vendors directly, whoever you're ordering through for the W-9, they're going to be ready to provide that information to you. So um, as soon as you as soon as you're ready for that, I would say go ahead and reach out and they'll get right back to you. They're um, they're being really fantastic on trying to be very responsive to folks because they know that you're up against this tight timeline. So we've been communicating back and forth with them for a few weeks now to try to get them staged and ready for your orders. Um, I saw that professional development was going to be offered with these carts. Do you have any timeline for those opportunities? So there are two uh, separate professional learning opportunities or buckets of opportunities, I guess you could call. Um, and There'll be plenty more information coming, but just to kind of quickly go over that um, and let you know that one, we will be having more info sessions that are specifically targeted to professional learning, um, uh, targeted more towards ordering the labs themselves. Um, but we will have ongoing professional learning that's being offered at the department by our digital learning. Okay. Um, and that the professional learning will be, be kind of ongoing that. and uh, by choice. And then we're also doing um, the CSI professional learning, which will be, um, will be able to provide a stipend to one educator per school to come and engage in a, I say come, but a lot of it is virtual, there's some in person, but engage in a year long um, computer science integration professional learning opportunity where they will learn skills um, to help coach others in their school building on integrating computer science and implementing these labs within their classroom. So um, we're looking to launch that early in December um, and the other professional learning will line up right around the same time. So I'd say in December, there should be lots of opportunities for engaging in computer science professional learning that will support these labs. Um, and if you have questions about that between now and the time we get more information out, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to have a conversation. 
Um, if gems isn't done, then we could still choose our carts without having it reopened. Um, so what you put on the Microsoft form is what needs to go into the gems application. So whatever was put in the Microsoft form is what has been allocated for your district. Um, and so uh, while you could change which type of lab, you can't change the quantity. So if you had four schools and only three requested a lab, you can't then add another lab to it. However, if you had three schools who requested a lab and they all chose robotics and programming, but now one of them wants coding and hardware, one of them wants augmented and virtual reality, that can be done um, in the GEMS application. Hopefully that's clear. Um, so the MS form was what was sent out in September for schools to select their mobile labs, correct? So the Microsoft form and the GEMS application were sent out almost at the same time. The GEMS application was sent out first, uh, but folks were having quite a few issues getting onto the GEMS portal and had very little time to troubleshoot. Um, and so to alleviate the potential for folks to miss out on this opportunity, we set up the Microsoft form, which was essentially being essentially a forum for you to be like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna fill out the GEMS application and this is what I will put in it when I can get into it. Um, and so the Microsoft form was essentially a band-aid until the GEMS application troubleshooting could happen. And so um, as Shelly's team is working on the GEMS application troubleshooting, uh, there, we're also getting folks who filled out the Microsoft form to get into GEMS. So um, ultimately GEMS is the official application and Microsoft form the Microsoft form was a way to um, basically reserve your labs if you were unable to get into the GEMS application. And they were both sent out in September. Uh, do we have to use Amazon to buy the folding carts? Uh, so no, uh, the carts cannot exceed the price that is listed in the um, in the lab options, like $109 or something like that. So ultimately it doesn't have to be purchased from Amazon, but it cannot exceed that amount or you won't be eligible to get reimbursed for that amount. Um, is that the end of our chat questions? Yes, okay. So now that we have made it through those, are there any other questions that have not come up um, in the chat for folks that you wanna come off of mute and talk about, you can either raise your hand or you can feel free to just um, come off of mute and ask away. Yeah, Hi, Stephanie. Oops. Oops. Oh, sorry, Valerie. Um, yeah, I apologize. I missed this. I had a phone call and I'm not sure when you're gonna be posting the recording, but I was curious about, um, if there are things like the craft pack, if we could purchase additional um, craft packs with any extra funding that's, um, you know, when, when we're adding everything up, if there's like a, a couple thousand left over, if we could purchase some of those um, consumables with that, or if we're just leaving that in the grant. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so uh, what is outlined in each mobile lab is what you're eligible to submit for reimbursement. So if there is extra money left over, it just kind of goes back. The um, As Shelly, and you may have missed this, Stephanie, so just to reiterate, as Shelly mentioned, we tried to make the process as easy as possible for districts. So it's a rounded out number, but we anticipate that you are only submitting for what's identified in the labs. Um, and then just for information, we will have this recording, which I missed the first couple minutes, which is just introductions and stuff, nothing real crucial um, by morning. So that it should be right on our website uh, right away. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, Valerie. So principals all understand this whole inventory list business. I haven't been involved in any other, you know, emergency fund grant um, requirements like this. So I just want to make sure, you know, that little detail get, is on their radar to keep for however long it's supposed to be kept. So depending on the role in which the principal also does, they may be aware of the inventory requirement. Your business manager is most definitely aware of it because everything that comes through in federal emergency relief funds come through this inventory process or federal funds period, whether it was Title II, which is the world I lived in before coming to the COVID funds, um, anything that's paid with federal with federal funds needs to be inventory. So your business managers most definitely knows that that needs to be inventory. 
but also the, the administrative team uh, who's ever been engaged in a monitoring process for any federal funds, Title II, Title I, uh, special services are aware of these inventory requirements. And I, our principal has been the point person on that, so I, he must know. Okay, great. Any other questions that are coming up for folks? All right, well, if anything comes up, feel free to reach out to myself or Shelly directly. We are living in this world right now, so we are trying to be as responsive as possible to questions and requests. Um, so that you can place your orders and get your equipment and get yourselves reimbursed as soon as possible. So um, thank you all for joining us and we will be posting the slides and the recording from this session on our website by tomorrow morning. Have a great evening. <laughs>